go into more about what we're doing. Um, uh, but yeah, a quick overview of just what we are and what we're trying to do. Um, we are uh, an infrastructure to uh, create financial products on blockchains. Um, and our mission here is really about universal market access. Uh, our whole belief and goal is that uh, financial risk should move freely across the internet, um, like information moves across the internet today. And the, uh, there's two components to our, our approach to our framework of how this works. Um, the first are what we call uh, financial contract templates. These are really design patterns to create financial products on blockchains. Um, we have uh, templates for creating synthetic tokens right now. These are tokens that can track anything with a price feed. Um, we'll talk a bit more about that later. We also just put out a research paper on building a decentralized BitMEX. Um, this would be another design pattern of how we could build uh, decentralized levered uh, derivatives uh, or decentralized levered derivative exchange. Uh, the second part, and what we're going to be talking about today, is our Oracle design. And this is an Oracle mechanism to power uh, these financial contract design patterns. And we're really talking about how to add economic guarantees to an Oracle to guarantee that this Oracle system cannot be corrupted and is actually like, truly and provably decentralized. So um, just to kind of introduce the problem and give you guys a bit of motivation here, um, we think financial innovation is useful, that's why we're here. Um, really excited about all the cool stuff that's going to get built in DeFi. Um, but all of these great financial products don't matter if the payouts uh, are going to get manipulated. Um, and our big starting premise here uh, is that any, any on-chain oracle can be corrupted. Um, and so it's sort of a big premise here, but we're basically saying that in the blockchain environment, there is always a bribe you can pay uh, to mess up or break one of these systems. Um, and so why does that exist in the fiat world? Um, and it's useful just to remember that the fiat world has this uh, very useful concept of laws against uh, bribery, manipulation, and, and fraud. <laughs> so um, in this example, we'll use this toy example of Bob and Alice a, a few times in the talk. So I'll just in this toy example, let's say Bob and Alice have a contract, a million dollar contract where they each put in 500 grand. And it's some bet. Um, and there's some external reference, which in the real world would be like a data source, uh, and on a blockchain it would be an oracle. There's some external reference that's going to determine the payout of this bet. Um, and so Alice could steal Bob's $500, or Bob could steal Alice's $500 if they can bribe that external reference to say whatever outcome they want. And now in the fiat world, um, this doesn't happen because Bob goes to jail. Uh, uh, it's a costly. Um, and so we got this really nice quality that we have like, you know, in the real world, we can send somebody and lock them up um, if they do bad things. But blockchains, of course, just don't have this concept of fraud. Um, it's a Byzantine world where, frankly, if Bob can manipulate this contact, uh, contract or can bribe this external reference, he will. Um, and what happens here is that this becomes a really big problem at scale. Um, so Bob, in this pseudo-anonymous world, can just keep writing these contracts. So he could have made $500 or 500 grand by bribing um, the last example with just Alice. But now let's just say he goes and does this again with Charlie, Dave, Eva, Fred. Now he can make two and a half million dollars by bribing the external reference. And of course, he can scale this limitlessly. Um, so not a good place to be. Um, and this is really why, uh, why we need economic guarantees uh, for these on-chain oracles. Um, so OK, let's just uh, back up and then like formally define the problem again. So we have uh, a, a permissionless blockchain environment where the only tool we have to motivate people uh, are private economic incentives. And so um, in order for us to trust that a smart, a smart contract that relies on off-chain inputs via an oracle, we have to prove that an attacker has no way to profit from manipulating this oracle system. And uh, the thing we want to bang the table about is that DeFi ultimately depends on this. If we want to, it's useful to think of it in the extreme case. So if we want to have trillions and trillions of dollars of value um, on uh, decentralized financial systems, 
that means that there is huge, like trillions and trillions of, of e incentives to bribe the oracles or the, uh, the, the oracle systems that are resolving these contracts. And so we really need to figure out this economic guarantee problem. All right, so how do we go about building this uh, oracle with uh, economic guarantees? Well, um, let's, let's define, let's try to formally define what this problem is. So we're starting with our starting premise here that all oracles are corruptible, um, that there exists some bribe out there uh, that we can pay. There's some minimum bribe out there that we can pay to successfully corrupt an oracle system. And so we're going to define that as our cost of corruption. Um, separately, there is some configuration of this blockchain. There's some configuration of this universe um, where we can extract the, the max profit, the worst case profit from this system. And we're going to call that maximum profit our profit from corruption. Um, so it follows then, like basic system here, that um, in order for this oracle to be honest under the assumption of an economically, economically rational actor, we need the cost of corruption to be greater than the profit from corruption. The COC, POC, PFC inequality, that's what we got to have hold true. So um, just to really hammer at home what I'm talking about here in our toy example with Alice and Bob, uh, the profit of corruption number here is the 500 grand that Alice or Bob could steal from each other if they could control the oracle. The cost of corruption is whatever we would pay to, to bribe uh, or to corrupt that, that external reference or that oracle. And so it follows that if Bob could make 500 grand by corrupting the external price reference, it better cost him more than 500 grand to bribe the oracle to do so. And that's, that's the basic inequality we're trying to solve. So how do we do this? Um, at a high level, we break it down into three steps. And then we'll, we'll go into more detail on, on what this looks like and how this works. So step one, let's uh, measure this cost of corruption. Uh, step two, let's measure the profit of corruption, prove it's accurate. And then let's design this mechanism to keep this inequality in check and prove it works. All right. So. Step one, we measure the cost of corruption with tradable voting rights. So UMA uses uh, a shelling point style voting system with these freely tradable voting tokens. And token holders are then paid a reward for voting with the majority, uh, uh, voting correctly with the majority, and they're penalized otherwise. Um, so what we end up, are, what we are able to then do is use the market to reveal the cost of corrupting the system. Um, and we'll go into that more on the next slide. Uh, part two, we measure our profit from corruption number with uh, sort of a simple contract registration framework where all contracts using this Oracle system are required to comply with a certain interface where they report their individual profit from corruption. So in that Alice Bob example, it would report back a number of 500 grand. And then we can simply calculate the system-wide profit from corruption of summing that value across all contracts. Uh, lastly, we then go and implement this, uh, maintain this inequality with what we're calling a variable fee policy. Um, so as the cost of corruption approaches the danger zone, as it approaches the floor, as it looks like that inequality might break, uh, the system levies a fee on all contracts using the system and uses that fee revenue to buy and burn the voting token to continuously reinforce uh, that inequality. So we'll just go in a bit more detail on each of these points um, and see where it takes us. So OK, to measure our cost of corruption, this is a, a, a voting system. We have these voting rights. They're tradable. To control the oracle, uh, simply the attacker simply needs to control half of the participating voting tokens. So in the case of 100% voter participation, that means an attacker needs to control 51% of the voting tokens. We have a parameter here, eta, where we just measure, we can measure the percentage of non-participating tokens and sim similarly adjust the number of tokens an attacker needs to control um, if, if there is some portion of un unparticipating token supply. Um, our cost of corruption is then simply the cost to buy that number of tokens. So ag again, in the case of, uh, in the simplifying case of 100% uh, of voter participation, our cost of corruption is the cost to buy 51% of these voting tokens. What's really nice about this is we use a market 
we use a freely tradable market to help us figure out what this cost is. So we're having the market reveal information to us by keeping these voting rights freely tradable. Um, our, our profit from corruption number, so again, to secure the system, we gotta measure the total value at risk, the total value that's being secured here. And to do this, um, as I mentioned, we have this interface that all contracts using the system have to comply with where they report their own individual profit from corruption value. Um, and then the system-wide PFC number can be calculated in a worst case analysis by summing that PFC across all contracts in the system. Um, there is a question of parasitic or unauthorized usage that we have a pretty interesting solution for that I'll, I'll come back to if we have time at the end. Um, um, and then let's go to this inequality. So if we, take, if we take the information on these two slides and we combine it with our um, COC PFC invariant, um, we can actually simply solve for just the, the floor price at which the system is secure. Um, and in some ways it's actually easier to just, uh, just make some, to, to conceptualize this with some simplifying assumptions. So let's just say that there is 100% voter participation um, and eta goes to zero here. Um, if you moved uh, the S back over to the other side, we're simply saying that the market cap of this voting token needs to be double the total value it's securing. Um, and so if we think about that, let's say the system is securing $25 million. That means we need 51% of the voting rights to cost at least $25 million. Or if we scale it up to 100% of the voting rights, we need the full market cap of the system to be greater than 50 million bucks. So that's, uh, that's just putting some real numbers around it to give us sense for the type of fairly simple math that we're concluding um, keeps our system secure. Um, in the paper, uh, we add in this concept of a safe price, which is just to give some resiliency to the system to make it not just be this hard barrier. So we define a target price that is some fraction above the floor price uh, to keep it secure. So if you read the paper and you see this P safe number, that's what we're really talking about. So, I still haven't answered for you guys how we maintain this P-safe target. And we do this um, by maintaining um, and initiating programmatic repeated token buybacks if and when the token price drops below its target. So if the price, in our example of uh, there's $25 million profit from corruption number that the system is securing, if the token price is greater than its, its floor of 50 million bucks, we do nothing. We're totally happy. But as it approaches that floor price, we levy a fee on the users of the system, on the contracts using the system, and we use that fee revenue to buy and burn tokens to support that uh, floor price. And because we do this all programmatically, um, and because it's immutably written in the logic of our system, we have absolute credibility that this is gonna happen. This is not like a central bank that can like change its mind. Um, this is written in the logic of the system, uh, absolutely. And so this actually creates a really interesting dynamic too, where uh, third party speculators know when a buyback is going to happen. And in concept, they actually have something of a free option. They have an asymmetric payoff, where if the, if the token price is supporting the floor, they know they have limited downside and potentially unlimited upside. So third party speculators can actually uh, enforce our, uh, our target for us, potentially without uh, the, us even needing to conduct the buybacks themselves. Um, at any rate, this is the buyback logic that happens each voting period, where we just go through and check, hey, is the system above its floor? Do we need to conduct a buyback? Um, if it's above its floor, do nothing. Uh, if it's below its floor, calculate the fees we need to be collect that need to be collected, collect those fees, and do this buy and burn. Um, and that's, that's the core program that keeps the inequality in check. So um, it's, it's pretty interesting to think about the costs of using this system. So what does it actually cost uh, for the contracts that are gonna use this Oracle? Um, and one of the nice features of this design is that we actually have a model for fundamental value, what fundamental value for the system should be worth. Um, and really it looks like a sort of uh, messed up discounted cash flow model where the market cap of the system, of this voting token at any time tau 
is equal to uh, the expected future buybacks, uh, all expected future buybacks discounted back to today. So, does this work? Yeah. So we have uh, effectively the summation of all the future fees, all the future buyback fees um, in expectation. And it, we end up, it looks just like a discounted cash flow model for uh, a, a, a dividend paying stock, although this is not a stock. Um, and so that's really interesting where we now have a token whose value should be reflective of the market's expectations of future usage. And what this means is that if there is an expectation of growth in the future, the token price today, or the voting token today, should trade above its floor, meaning we don't need to charge any fees to use the token. So it's this weird way where we can borrow from the future, we can borrow from future um, expectations of future gro growth to make using the protocol costless in the near term. To put hard numbers around that, let's go back to our example where today the system is securing $25 million of value, implying a token floor of 50 million bucks, but the market thinks it's going to secure $250 million of value in a year's time. That future expectation should be reflected in the token price today, pushing the token price above its floor, meaning it's, uh, it's secure and we don't need to charge any fees to the contracts using the system. Um, now, of course, there is no free lunch, right? Uh, at steady state, when there is no expectation of growth, we do levy fees on all the contracts using the system. So for argument's sake, let's say that number is a, a, a billion dollars. We have a billion dollars of value being secured by the system, but nobody thinks it's growing anymore. Um, fees will need to be charged on all the contracts using the system to compensate the voters for both the capital that they've locked into the system and the work they're doing. And you know, if you assume like what a, what a nice return would be, let's say it's something like 10%, um, that actually sounds like an awfully large number that we'd have to charge the contracts using the system. We'd have to charge them, say, a 10% annualized rate to use this oracle. Um, that seems way too high and seems implausible. But then we have to remember that there is leverage embedded in this system, and increasing leverage as blockchains get faster. So if we did have a billion dollar profit from option number in the future, um, our expectation is that's actually securing like $100 billion of value, of notional value. And then that 10% fee being levied at the steady state actually looks like a, one, uh, a 10 basis point um, or 0.1% annualized fee uh, on the total notional being secured. All right. So what kind of contracts can actually use um, this system? And um, I'm actually going to flip it around and talk more about our, our sort of philosophy for how uh, financial contracts, how DeFi contracts should use an oracle. Um, so we actually put out a piece of research uh, after the submission deadline for um, this conference. And uh, so I'll just highlight some of those concepts um, and, and I'd love you guys to read them and give us feedback. Um, we put out this paper uh, proposing a design for a decentralized BitMEX that we're calling BitDEX. Um, and it, how it uses what we're naming priceless contracts uh, uh, to allow uh, this really scalable high-speed DeFi contract to exist. And the idea here is that we really only need to use an oracle. The safest thing we can do is to minimize our oracle usage, to only use an oracle when we absolutely need to. And a core concept um, is to look back at the fiat world where you know, we could enter into a, a, a fiat legal contract um, on anything, um, and we enter into that contract, you know, under the laws of the state of California without the intention of litigating it. Um, we only litigate if there's a dispute, if we think the contract hasn't been fulfilled. Um, the same concept can and should be applied to designing DeFi contracts in the blockchain space, where we only need an oracle if the participants within the contract themselves say that there's a dispute. In the happy or optimistic path, uh, counterparties shouldn't actually even need an on-chain price feed. Um, they shouldn't need a price at all. They should just agree that the contract has been fulfilled. And this is actually borrowing a lot of the concepts from uh, conversations we had with like Plasma Group doing like optimistic roll-up stuff. Some of the same things Vitalik talked about earlier, where we really are using this concept of like an optimistic solution, an optimistic happy path, um, to mean that we don't need an on-chain price feed at all. 
we only use an oracle as a form of a dispute resolution process, kind of the dispute resolution of this interactive challenge response game when there is a dispute between the contract participants, participants themselves. Um, and we got a lot more to talk about here that I'm really excited for us to be talking about in the future. Um, but this is a kind of core concept that we think fits very elegantly with our Oracle design because going back a slide, like we only need this, e these economic guarantees are relatively expensive. We only should use an Oracle like this. We only really should use an Oracle ever when we need to. Um, and so more on that that we'll be publishing. Um, okay, so quick just updates on our status of development and what we want feedback on. Um, our code for the first version of this uh, data verification mechanism, Oracle, has been deployed to testnet. Um, uh, we are putting some more polish on it uh, and we will be uh, deploying this to mainnet late this year or early next year. Um, we also do have financial contract templates that we spend a lot of time and energy on. This is the other part of what we do. Um, we have templates for synthetic tokens. Um, if you guys go to tokenbuilder.umaproject.org, you can go right now and create a synthetic token on Rinkeby Testnet in like 30 seconds, that maybe like three minutes, uh, that tracks uh, anything with a price feed. Um, and we'll be also at ETH Waterloo uh, if anyone's there and wants to talk more about synthetic tokens. And like I mentioned earlier, we just put out this research paper on how to build a decentralized BitMEX that interfaces with our Oracle. Um, this is some of our research. Uh, we do have these handy tweet storms that summarize these papers, both the BitDEX paper for um, this decentralized BitMEX, as well as uh, the white paper that's behind this talk for our Oracle with economic guarantees. Uh, love feedback on this, would love feedback on the white papers themselves, of course. Um, and lastly, like, we have a developer Slack. Uh, the link is on our GitHub. Uh, would love to engage with you guys. Follow us on Twitter. Um, you can follow me on Twitter too, Hal2001. My DMs are open. Um, and if we have time for a question or two, we could do that. Or we could talk about parasitic usage. <laughs> It's uh, basically deterministic, so it, you're not going to get into a situation where it's close to a 50-50 vote between your voters, because that would be very cheap to corrupt. That's a very great point. Yeah, we're not, we're not looking at binary votes. Um, the actual mechanics of how uh, the oracle responds to a price um, work like this. Um, if we're asking people to give us a specific price uh, at a specific time, and so if greater than 50% of the voting power responds with the exact same price, the modal price, we return that. Um, if there is no mode that has more than 50% of the voting power, uh, we calculate the median and return that price and reward the voters that voted between the 25th and 75th percentile. So it's a, it's a game that's designed to incentivize very sharp uh, precision around like what is the exact price at that exact time. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Hold on. So if I want to use an oracle for settlement of a simple futures contract, then the payout of the futures contract is possibly unbounded, right? So if I subvert the oracle, I can effectively have an infinite Price. How does that fit with your setup? Uh, how is the payout unbounded? Like, what do, you, what do you mean by that? Well, if I am short a futures contract and the price has gone to infinity, then the futures contract is worth infinity at settlement. Uh, yeah, I mean, if something, if so, price so, going to infinity. So, so remember- No, but, but someone can report arbitrarily high price as much as your, you know, integer library supports. And, right? then, and then they'll win the, they'll, they'll lose yeah, the dispute. So, so, yeah. so it just, you know, it'll just, the Oracle will then respond back with whatever the right price is. So no, but the, but, the, but the gain from corruption is unbounded in this case. Uh, so, okay, let's walk back here for a second. So let's just say we're doing a $100 bet between you and me. 
No, uh, no, no, we're not. We're, talk, we're not doing a hundred dollar bet. That's the point. I want uh, a simple futures contract. Let's say it's uh, the price is a hundred dollars. I'm short. You're long, right? Price could go to infinity, and I owe you infinity money, right? Well, I'm not going to pay out infinity money along the way. So it starts going to 150 or 200, and at some point you're like, okay, I think I, you think I'm not doing my side of the deal. Then you dispute me and say, hey, Hart here isn't making his side of the deal right. He's not putting in the right amount of money. He's not maintaining his short position. He's not distributing or depositing his right margin requirement. And then it would go to an oracle. But there's no way for you to sort of unilaterally say, hey, the price is an infinity, and I have to like cough up money, because we wouldn't have got there. Like, there's a path to get there. We'll talk about it more offline, yeah. Um, do, are we, sorry. Um, how do you guarantee that people report uh, honestly their profit from corruption? Um, so, the, well, the, the, if profit from corruption, okay, phrased differently. So, you, um, the way contracts are created that use the system, the Oracle only responds to contracts that come from um, what we're calling a known bytecode template. So we have approved interfaces. We have contracts that get voted in that say, hey, this is a, a valid contract type, and our Oracle will only respond to, other con to contracts of that valid contract type. Presumably so, I could take that data, though, and then go trade on it, like, wherever, once I get that, right? What you can do, like the core, the cleanest kind of parasitic usage sort of thought experiment. Yeah, my question was kind of about parasitic yeah, usage yeah. in general. Um, which right. we might not have time for, and so I might have to go into more detail afterwards. But the cleanest example is like, let's say we're going to do a million dollar contract, but we want to be parasitic about it. So we do a dollar valid contract, a dollar authorized contract, and we do a million dollar contract that just pays out how that dollar contract pays out. We have a design, what we're calling fuzzing that contract, where we can add, we can have other people basically break that game, and we'll, I don't want to go too far over, so we might have to talk about this afterwards, but this is the core idea of how we handle the parasitic usage problem, where we can eliminate, we can create a game, we can basically break uh, the incentives to create that parasitic contract in the first place. So I'll leave that as a cliffhanger, and we'll talk about this, like, separately. Um, Hi, I just wanted to make sure I was understanding, um, I don't know too much about how your system works, but you were talking about how many uh, token holders vote, and I don't know in the system what your expectation for that is. So if too few vote, though, then the price of the currency would have to go up dramatically, is that correct? And, and uh, yeah, you explain that a bit. We have, um, we have a parameter for what we're calling, like, basically the size of our reward. So if you don't vote or voter participation is too low, we crank up the rewards getting paid to the people that are voting and penalize all the people that aren't voting. And so we will adjust that aggressively to ensure that we have significant voter participation because the system does critically depend on there being high voter participation. There's other aspects of this too, like uh, token distribution, where if we distribute tokens, we want to distribute tokens to people that are going to vote. So this is not like, uh, tokens should not be held by speculators or people that just like, you know, aren't, aren't going to be productive uh, participants um, in the system itself. All right, thank you guys very much. Sorry for going over.